morning. Welcome to the Los Angeles World Affairs Council and Town Hall. I'm Kim McClary, President and CEO, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you all to today's program. And thank you all for your ongoing viewership and support. Please stay tuned to, to the end of today's program for a quick update on our upcoming programs. And if you're not yet a member of the Los Angeles World Affairs Council Town Hall, please consider joining today. It's a great way to support us and there's so many benefits. For those of you who would like to be asking our speaker and moderator questions today, there's a control panel on the right-hand side of your screen where you can type in your questions. Jessica Deganzik, our Vice President of Events, will be managing your questions during the Q&A portion of today's program, which will start in about 30 or 35 minutes. You can keep your questions totally anonymous. Today, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker and moderator. Our speaker is journalist Peter Martin. Peter joins us today to discuss his new book, China's Civilian Army, The Making of Wolf Warrior Diplomacy. Formerly based in Beijing, Peter is now a political reporter for Bloomberg News. He has written extensively on escalating tensions in the US and China relationship and has reported from China's border with North Korea and its far western region of Xinjiang. He holds degrees from the University of Oxford, Peking University, and the London School of Economics. Moderating the conversation with Peter is Professor Jeffrey Wasserstrom, who is the Chancellor's Professor, History School of Humanities at the University of California, Irvine. Professor Wasserstrom is a specialist in modern Chinese history with a strong interest in connecting China's past to its presence and placing both into global perspective. Peter, welcome. Professor Wasserstrom, it's wonderful to see you again. I know we have so many things to cover, so let me turn this program over to you. Okay, it's a pleasure to get to be back here. I always enjoy doing events with the uh, Los Angeles World Affairs Council and Town Hall. And it's a great pleasure to be getting to host this event with Peter Martin, um, who, as with so many people who you start reading during the pandemic, I haven't met in person. So this is as close as we've gotten to, um, to being in the same room. Um, but the book is an important one and it couldn't be a more, um, a more timely one at the moment when it looks at the role of um, Chinese diplomats throughout the People's Republic of China, the history of it, and also as an effort to put into perspective the particular strain of uh, Chinese diplomatic engagement at, at the moment. And this is, of course, a moment when leaders from around the world, um, with the notable absence of um, Xi Jinping, among others, were just gathering for uh, the G20 meetings and are now gathering for major climate, um, climate change meetings. So talking about um, visions of China's place in the world couldn't be more timely. I would like to hold up a copy of the physical book, but I've been reading it uh, online. So this is the closest that I can do with it, uh, reading it in proofs. And it is, um, it's well-written, it's lively, and it's um, deeply informed. And I wanna begin by just drawing Peter out uh, about the book. And I find one way it's always interesting is to ask him if he could tell us something that's in the book that he think would thinks would surprise um, some some listeners, even well-informed listeners like World Affairs Council ones. What's something that you'd like people to take away with it that they might not have understood um, before reading it? Yeah. Um, well, thanks so much for for hosting this. It's a real it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, you know, I, I guess the 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 one thing that sort of jumped out to me um, as I as I was doing the research was. You know, when when we watch Chinese diplomats um, on stage in press conferences or we see news reports about them, they're often in incredibly stern and they just they kind of unrelentingly repeat uh, the 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 official lines of of the Communist Party. But 
you know, it, it, it became clear as I was researching that, that a lot of the time under the surface, there's a great deal of critical reflection and, and thinking going on. And, you know, so when, when Chinese diplomats were posted to, to London and the US in the 1980s, they were thinking hard about, you know, what well, maybe we should be rethinking capitalism and maybe, maybe communism doesn't work so well for China. And, and some of them were even thinking about maybe China should embrace a, a democratic system. And so, um, I found that really useful as, as you kind of watch these wolf warrior displays recently with Chinese diplomats storming out of meetings and shouting at foreign counterparts and all of these kinds of things. They, they might not be so comfortable with that always um, uh, deep down. Okay, well, I was going to ask you uh, also what surprised you the most when you were doing the research, but it sounds like that's a version of the same thing, this kind of separate, you know, I mean, I should say that you've done a great service to many of us in the field reading a lot of um detailed accounts that uh memoirs by diplomats which to be honest was not a source that i realized was a, a rich one was that surprising to you to find out just how many there were to go through yeah i mean you know i i think um it's always like my, you know kind of my my deep bias in in conducting research on China is that if you're willing to sit down and use Chinese language sources, um, even ones coming out of the highly censored and, and um, politically sensitive environment of Beijing now, you'll be rewarded for it, you know, like sitting down and going through Xi Jinping's speeches or his writings, there's a surprising amount there that you can draw out, um, even given all the limitations. So that was kind of my starting point for looking at these books. and. And yeah, there were a ton of them published. Uh, I've, I've used over a hundred of them, and there are there are a number that I never got round to to reading that were mainly published from kind of the the 1990s and the early 2000s, kind of a a, a relatively more open period in, in in Chinese history. And you know, it's important to stress like th th this is all relative, right? These are still pretty tightly buttoned down um, accounts and, and, and heavily censored and all of those kinds of things, but they, they contain little glimpses that kind of illuminate what it was like to be a Chinese diplomat. Okay, so to take us through the book for, to a certain extent, you spent a lot of time with Zhou Enlai and his, um, his influence, and while I think it would be good to, I'm saying it was a timely book because of what's going on in the world right now, but it's also timely in a way because exactly 50 years ago, the final arrangements were being made, presumably largely by, by Zhou Enlai, for the event that looms so large in US-China relations, um, Nixon's visit. So can you tell us a bit about Zhou Enlai and the stamp he puts even today on foreign, uh, foreign relations? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that the best way to think of Zhou when it comes to, so, so Zhou Enlai was China's, um, the communist China's first foreign minister and uh, premier and had been uh, around in the Communist Party um, from its, its very early days, helping to set up a, a youth branch of, of the party in, in, in Paris. Um, and, you know, he was this kind of deeply suave and urbane figure. He spoke a number of foreign languages, had lived in multiple foreign countries, including France and, and Japan. Um, and, and very early on realized that if this kind of underground group of, of rebels, um, which wanted to overthrow the, the government in China and ultimately take power, if they were going to succeed, they would need to build ties with um, the outside world. And, and Zhou started, even before the communists came to power, kind of putting together a small group of, of foreign affairs specialists who could start to do that start to build ties with other communist parties around the world, but also increasingly foreign governments. And um, really, he, he kind of went on to become the founding father of, of Chinese diplomacy, a, a figure who I think is best thought of a little bit like J. Edgar Hoover in the FBI, you know, someone whose personality and approach permeates the whole of, of an organization. And you can see it today in the way that Chinese diplomats act with this extraordinary self-control, um, this meticulous attention to detail, um, this, this focus on, on hierarchy and following orders. All of these things were, were kind of uh, shaped by the Communist Party, but they were also shaped by the personality of Zhou Enlai. And, and, and really, you can see his influence very much today, I think. 
So one of the questions that I've been I've been working on an earlier period in Chinese history, I'm writing about the Boxer Crisis of 1900, and one thing I'm very interested in is whether it's a through line for diplomats of the PRC to always talk about the Chinese people as a single entity. This is one one aspect of Wolf Warrior diplomacy now is to say that certain events offend 1.4 billion people and has an idea if you if you criticize the Chinese Communist Party, you are criticizing and hurting the feelings of the Chinese people. Is that something that's there from the beginning or do diplomats early on have a more variegated sense of what China is and who belongs to it? Do you get any sense of that? It's a, it's a really interesting question. I mean, I guess, I guess I do see it as something that has quite a lot of continuity. I mean, clearly at, at times in modern China's history, that's been a, a pretty big lift. You know, you think of the delegation that China, uh, before the communist revolution, the, the delegation that China sent to the Paris Peace Conference at Versailles, uh, China itself was split up between multiple competing governments at the time and, and, and put together a delegation composed of those competing and varied governments. But they, they too had to kind of uh, communicate in this way that, that embraced this, this fiction of like one Chinese people speaking with one voice. And, and um, they, they did so quite admirably. And, you know, as after the communists took power, um, that, that, that became an easier task with the, the obvious exceptions of, of territories like Hong Kong and, and, um, and Taiwan. But um, yeah, that, you know, that, that, that really did become kind of one Chinese people, one voice, one narrative, one history um, was something that was, was kind of easier to put forward after 1949, I think. Yeah, I can see that. I was just, I've, I've mentioned to you uh, privately that I'm reading by a diplomat in 1900 who's saying it would be foolish for Americans to develop anti-Chinese sentiments toward residents of Chinatown because of what the boxers were doing, attacking Christians, because the boxers were from North China and the residents of Chinatowns were from South China, uh, overwhelmingly, as were many of the diplomats um, as well, and many of the reform-minded um, figures as well. So the idea was that this, this diplomat, Wu Tingfang, was saying the people of South China, they're, they have a different culture and they speak a completely different language. And that was just so I had a kind of whiplash having spent some time focusing on Hong Kong, where the language of Chinese diplomats is that Hong Kong is immutably part of the same entity and the people are of one group. So are there any, in the diplomats you've studied, does their place of origin matter? Are there sort of different, do they come from all over China or do you get any sense that where they're from matters or it just doesn't matter? Yeah, uh, it's it, it mattered a great deal to them on a on a personal level. Um, you know, lots of the the very so, so just a little context for the for the audience. Um, when the the Communist Party established its rule in 1949, um, there was this small group of people, kind of foreign affairs specialists I mentioned, who had had kind of been shadowing Zhou and Lai for a long time, but most of China's first diplomats were drawn at the senior level from the People's Liberation Army. So they were former military generals and they went on to be ambassadors to different places. And at the junior level, they were drawn from universities. They were junior soldiers um, who had been on the front lines of, of, of fighting Japan and the, the nationalists in China, and they were fresh university graduates. So a lot of these people had uh, you know, they spoke no foreign languages. Many had never met a foreigner before. But you know, even beyond that, they'd never. Some of them had never been to a city before. Um, had never been. You know, had tra never travelled much outside of um, the places that they had been posted in the in the in the civil war. And so, you know, I remember reading accounts by people who who visited Beijing for the first time. And there was a young um, a young recruit whose friends had told him this would have been i think the the early 1950s his friends told him you know when you show up in beijing in northern china it's going to be so cold that your pee will freeze uh when you go to the bathroom and you're going to need a stick to kind of free yourself and <laughs> he kind of you know he kind of half believed it and so they were they were really entering a very foreign land 
um, and, and, and had a great sense of awareness of where they were from and why that made them different. But, but of course, um, China's leaders required of them that they, they would adopt this, as you said, this kind of singular voice of the Communist Party, which represented kind of the eternal interests of the Chinese people to the world. And so they very, very quickly had to adapt to that and, and forget kind of those regional differences as much as they could. Did you have a favorite? I mean, in reading all of these accounts, was there one of these diplomats who you wished you could sit down and have uh, have dinner with and talk about their experiences? Yeah, so so I, I alluded to him um, a little bit earlier um, when I when I talked about diplomats being posted to to Margaret Thatcher's Britain, but but uh, uh, the, my favorite by far was this this diplomat called Kehua, who was um, actually Xi Jinping's first father-in-law. So Xi Jinping's first marriage um, ended in divorce, um, and his his first wife's father was a was a diplomat. This kind of um, veteran revolutionary who had served in Yan'an, the Communist Party base, before um, before the Communist Revolution um, succeeded and the Communists came to power, and who who kind of rose up through the party ranks and, and became ambassador to London in the in the late 1970s, just before Margaret Thatcher became Britain's Prime Minister, and he, of course, had been raised with this I, this belief that communist revolution was coming to the world, that capitalist societies exploited their citizens, that the, the workers in these countries were ready to rise up and overthrow their governments, um, and that, that China's model of communism was, was um, superior um, and, and, and you know, really represented the interests of the workers of, of China and the world. And, and Kerr arrived in Britain just on the cusp of this kind of extraordinary transformation that, that 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 reverberated around the world in the 1980s with Margaret Thatcher's you know ne neoliberal kind of approach to economics in Britain but of course also Ronald Reagan economic reforms in Chile and, and other countries and um, he watched that unfold and he started to send cables back to Beijing saying, you know, capitalism really doesn't seem to work in the way that we originally thought. I don't think that British workers are about to overthrow their government. And by the way, the health service provides them with free treatment. And when his, you know, his kid got sick in Britain's National Health Service, he even provided him free milk and food. And, you know, so he was just this incredibly perceptive, sharp thinker who was constantly reevaluating the world around him at this time of extraordinary transformation. And, and I, I, I found that, that curiosity really captivating and I would love to be able to sit down with him. Um, although if I did, and if I was allowed to, I, I, I have, he's, he's, he's dead, but I, I, I spoke to um, former British diplomats who did have the chance to sit down with him and, and Kerr, as you would expect, was, um, just the you know the kind of the model Chinese diplomat. He sat down, repeated the party line, was relentless in the way that he did it, and um, gave no sign that any of that thinking was going on to the surface. So may, maybe if I, I did meet him in person, it wouldn't be that fun after all. Have you? Can you talk more about the method for the the book? So you did some interviews. Um, did you get to talk to current Chinese diplomats, or was it had to be second? second hand I mean you did read the memoirs and other but what else did you rely on for the book yeah I mean so so lots and lots of kind of formal interviews with um with foreign um diplomats who had spent their careers interacting with China so people uh, who had served in the U.S. State Department British diplomats Indian diplomats kind of ev everyone I could um I could I, 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 I could sit down with um, kind of on the foreign side and of course those conversations can be much more open and lengthy and then on the, on the Chinese side I had to be a little bit more well a lot a lot more cautious in the way that I approached things I was working as a journalist in Beijing at the time um, and but the way I kind of ap approached that was to track, I, I had I had some really good interviews with, with some former Chinese diplomats, but then also to to kind of approach current Chinese diplomats with um, uh, open-ended, inquisitive questions, right? So, oh, you know, you you guys seem like um, the, a, a great deal of training must go into what you do. How does that work? You know, th those kind of non 
threatening uh, questions uh, just ask hundreds and hundreds of times kind of start to uh, provide you with little insights that you can add together and, and kind of start to use to paint a, a picture. But, um, you know, it's it's difficult as a foreign, you know, the Chinese government is pretty suspicious of foreign journalists. So you need to do that in a way that is kind of, um, like I said, gentle and as non-threatening as possible. So can we, I think the this audience will probably want to know some things about your take on what's going on today and including the sort of the way um, diplomats fit into this, the way that the role of um, the Chinese political leader making uh, statements versus representatives of a different sort. So can you talk to us about how you see things like the G20 meetings? Does it matter if Xi Jinping goes or not? Or are we basically going to hear the same things from um, the diplomats or 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 not? And the same with um, the Glasgow meetings now. So what's your take on what's happening now? Yeah, I mean, so I, I think it's really striking and, and, and honestly pretty surprising that Xi Jinping has had such a um, low profile approach to this, this G20 meeting. Um, as uh, many people listening will know, during the Trump administration, President Xi kind of saw these international forums as a way for, for China to step into a global void that was being created by um, the US kind of pulling away from multilateral institutions. He gave speeches at, um, you know, APEC meetings. He was incredibly active at G20 meetings. He gave a, he gave a very well publicized speech at the Davos Forum in January 2017 and, and, and used those platforms to kind of discuss China's approach to a, an open world and globalization and, and all of these kind of things and to draw implicit contrast with the United States. So it is surprising to me that, that she is not there. I've heard um, officials in, in, in Washington kind of speculate that, um, you know, one reason that she might not want to attend in person is um, to kind of deprive the West of a leadership opportunity. You know, you can't have meaningful action on, on climate or on the global economy without China. And if China kind of step back a little bit, perhaps it will deprive the West of a win. I think that that there's probably some truth in that, but the, the overriding factor, I think, is just this um, extraordinary uh, focus on security that China has for its top leadership and the worry that if, you know, this idea that Xi Jinping is, is, is central to China's fate and China's ability to succeed in, as a country. And if, if he is somehow put in danger by being exposed to COVID-19, then, then China can't succeed. And um, that's the belief, I think, but from you know, a lot of people in Beijing anyway. And um, so I think, I think it really probably is a you know, safety concerns about him traveling, him leaving the country that, that um, are kind of front of mind there. Yeah, and I think it, it may have also been easier to play the role of a contrasting kind of leader while Trump was who you were uh, compared to. I mean, one of the exactly. things that she, when he was doing a lot of his traveling, he would, it's its funny when you brought up Joe and Lai, he would present something of a kind of a new version of Joe and Lai, this sort of, um, he would talk about the literature of different countries he read, he pre present himself as a very cosmopolitan um, figure. And now what you're describing is a bit more like um, the Mao role. You know, Mao very rarely mm -hmm. uh, left the country, only a couple of times um, to go to Moscow, I think, um, which is very different from the generation of leaders that were more um, sort of uh, robustly cosmopolitan. Um, right. And, you know, and that that does create uh, or it does, that does have implications, I think, for the way that China presents to the world, because Xi Jinping kind of has these two personalities, you know, this APEC and Davos Xi Jinping, which is all about openness and globalization. And then there's the Xi Jinping that talks to domestic audiences and speeches and he dresses in a, you know, a, a, a Mao suit, um, he reviews troops in Beijing, does video addresses, and his language in those speeches is often extremely nationalist, uh, uses lots of references to, to Marxist ideology, uh, lots of kind of stirring language about China 
never giving an inch of its territory to foreigners and never never tracking bullying at foreign hands and those kind of things and uh, those things can go down quite well domestically but when they're translated and they go out into the the world it it contributes to this image of a more assertive and threatening and worrying china which um has obviously created so much controversy in in the west recently yeah, no, you've hit on a very important thing about Xi Jinping, the number of different, well, the number of titles he's taken up and the number of roles he, I mean, I love Jeremy Barmay's line, which is just call him chairman of everything. <laughs> right. Um, but he has, over time, it seems, begun to relish more some of the martial roles, uh, overseeing military parades. He did a very, a very big one in uh, Hong Kong in the, um, the 20th anniversary of the handover in uh, 2017, and he does seem to relish that. Well, which is very different. I think the Davos Xi Jinping, as you put it, is 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 quite different there. Right. So, is there any? Do you think there's division among the diplomats? I mean, clearly there would have to be. But are there any signs that there may be the the wolf warrior mood among diplomats is something that is we should probably explain to if anybody in the audience doesn't know where that came from you know where that term wolf warrior comes from and do you think there are there are some diplomats who are particularly exemplifying it you know playing that role to the hilt just now yeah so so the 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 term comes from this 2017 blockbuster movie called wolf warrior 2 which is kind of like a, a chinese version of Rambo, I guess, is, is that kind of action movie which features a, a Chinese hero kind of battling foreign bad guys on the continent of Africa. And um, it was this kind of runaway commercial success, I think, much to the surprise of everyone involved, including the, the film's makers. And, and I think the, the reason for that is that it captured this sense in 2017 that the world was changing and that perhaps China's time had arrived. Um, and that, that that Beijing no longer needed to show the kind of deference and caution toward the outside world that it had shown in the past. And, and you know, so the, the movie captured something uh, among the Chinese public along those lines. And at the same time, Chinese diplomats around the world had started really changing the way that they, they interacted with foreigners. And so uh, getting into spats on Twitter walking out of international forums um uh you know spreading conspiracy theories a couple of years later around the origins of, of coronavirus and you know even even telling foreign leaders to to shut up and barging into the the offices of papua new guinea's foreign minister and all kinds of tactics which we would never have associated with chinese diplomats in the 90s or the 2000s and so foreign media started to use that term wolf warrior diplomacy to, to kind of describe that confluence of Chinese nationalism and Chinese diplomacy, which, which we've seen in recent years. And you know, I think it's when, when, when we're thinking about how, how far that's embraced across China's diplomatic establishment, I think it's important to recognize that there's a lot of consensus among Chinese foreign policy leaders that you know, China's role in the world has changed in really fundamental ways and, and that there can be no going back to the 1990s. You know, one, one phrase that people kind of repeat a lot in Beijing is that you can't hide an elephant. And so the idea is that China has now grown, it's the second biggest economy in the world. It is rapidly catching up with the US militarily, that it's become too big for it to kind of uh, emulate those kind of low key tactics that it used so successfully in the 90s. But so there's there's a lot of agreement on that. Where I think that that some Chinese diplomats disagree is the the, the tactics that that necessitates. Some people think that okay, so now China is so powerful that our economic and military might will speak for themselves, and others will have to fall into line. And if they don't, that's too bad, and eventually they'll they'll get on board. Um, and and those those kinds of people tend to think of you know. America's cultural power and success and ability to persuade stem from its hard power. That's that's that that kind of line of thinking. And you know, if if one diplomat has come to kind of symbolize that approach, it's Foreign Ministry spokesman Zhao Li Jin, who was uh, a relatively obscure figure in China's embassy in Islamabad, 
managed to get himself in a Twitter fight with former US national security advisor, Susan Rice, and kind of was catapulted to success and ended up being promoted in the foreign minister and made, and made spokesman. Um, and so Zhao has kind of come to represent that new assertive breed of diplomats. But there are others inside the foreign ministry um, and outside who, who think that this approach is far too strident and that you know, even, even the, the most powerful of countries needs to maintain the ability to persuade others and to make its, its case. And, uh, you know, someone like the, the recently um, departed um, U.S. ambassador who, who, who just left um, Washington, Toi Ting Kai, uh, is, is someone who's more in that kind of charm offensive type, um, type mold. But I, I don't think those people feel very empowered at the moment in Xi Jinping's China. He seems to like the assertive approach. And as far as I can see, it's going to be here for a while. Have, have you begun to um, do any kind of checking out of American foreign policy establishment now that you're based in DC? Do you see that? Does it does the work on this project give you a different way of thinking of foreign, about foreign diplomats in the PRC? Um, yeah, I mean, so I, I mean, I, I spend more of my time doing kind of reporting on the Pentagon and the intelligence agencies at the moment, but um, I do interact with with US diplomats and I think um, uh, you know, it's right. They're 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 all a lot more comfortable at the moment now that they're kind of back to um, uh, repeating talking points from the State Department, which are much more familiar to them and and under the Biden administration than maybe some of the talking points were under under President Trump. Um, you know, you think of State Department officials having to tell counterparts in Mexico. Um, uh we will build a wall and you're going to pay for it that's that's a pretty that's a pretty difficult message to sell so i think there's there's a great deal more comfort here but you know in 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 general i i think kind of the experience of 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 comparing the two systems has has given me quite a lot of respect for this the level of skill that that state department officials have and and you know i i talked to one um former us ambassador who i'm, I'm sure you know chas freeman who who has actually you know, started his career as an as a translator for President Nixon when he visited uh, Mao Zedong's China and he talks about diplomacy as this art of persuasion where you have to convince the other person in the room that it's in their interests to follow a course of policy which you favour and the way that you do that is to garner all of the insights that you've gathered in terms of, of, of the history of the place that you've been posted the culture and then you know the real nuance of like what's the mood in the room and and what can i get done today and so you take quite a well-defined set of talking points from your government back home and you kind of spin them in a way using all of that knowledge that makes them most persuasive and i think at their best with a good set of messages to sell U.S. diplomats can be extraordinarily effective at that art, and I think that that Chinese diplomats, not through lack of skill, but really because of the constraints that China's political system places on them, they really struggle to do that. They're good at using economic incentives to induce others to act in ways that they want with promises of infrastructure spending and trade deals, and they're good at threatening others with, you know, economic coercion or or even forms of military coercion but they're not good at persuading others and i think that uh, that really comes from kind of the strictures of, of china's political system great so we're going to be moving to the question and answer session and um jessica um Duganzik is going to be joining us to take questions and you can submit those and um as i think is always important with with um with uh, events related to China. If you would like your question to be asked anonymously, um, that's fine. You might want to flag that. Um, often the questioners won't be mentioned, but if you want us to know who's asking the question, you can put that um, in the chat as well. Um, so I have plenty more questions, but if there are ones coming in, uh, we'll be happy to start taking them from you now. So Jessica, are there ones that Yes, we have a few questions coming in, and Jeff, we might go to, back to you, uh, or feel free to jump into some of your questions as well. So, 
Uh, to our audience, thank you as always for joining us today and continuing to support our programs. Um, of course, these are complimentary events at this time, but um, we would really welcome any support that you can offer, whether you become a member or make a contribution to the World Affairs Council. You can visit our website at lawacth.org and again, become a member or make a donation. We greatly appreciate it. Um, all right, Peter, our first question. Can you explain why China is re reported on reliable sources of COVID exposure as having only a minuscule number of cases and deaths? For example, under 125,000 or under 5,000? Uh, so can I explain why deaths are so have been so low? Or why they're um, being reported that way, yes. Yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm no expert on the topic, I think, but there, the, there's quite a lot of consensus outside of China if you look at the way that the, the US government, for example, talks about um, the spread of COVID there, that uh, probably the official statistics don't fully reflect the severity of the initial outbreak and that perhaps official deaths were, were much higher than re reported. And that's that's something that, um, you know, is pretty, if pe people who have been dealing with China for a long time know that's, that's, that's pretty characteristic of the system. Bad news tends to get underreported and officials don't tend to have very much incentive to kind of send bad news up to their superiors um, in case they land themselves in trouble. And that's that's true of bad economic growth numbers, pollution numbers, and it's also true of things like hospitalizations and, and, and death from deadly diseases like COVID. So I think I think some of that is um, is at play. But but I also think that there's quite a lot of consensus that that China did after the initial outbreak um, manage to get the disease under control in a way that um, most European countries and, and the United States didn't manage to. Um, and, and I think, you know, that that is probably a reflection of the way that um, a disease like COVID kind of plays into some of the inherent strengths that the Chinese government has um, when it comes to um, putting controls on society. Right, like you know, the, the US government has been subjected to lawsuits when it's tried to introduce mask mandates or to, to uh, you know vaccine mandates and there have been battles going on at the state level and the federal level and the local level and dip right down to school boards and, and these kinds of things and the Chinese party state doesn't face that kind of um, backlash when it tries to introduce lockdown um, measures or, or mandates and I remember being in Beijing you know I was there from January to June um, when the, the outbreak uh, kind of the early days of the outbreak and and even before it had uh spread beyond china's borders and become a global pandemic and i i remember thinking that these kind of neighborhood committees that you see that are kind of made up of volunteers and pensioners and and you know they, they seem quite cuddly and you can't be you know, kind of ineffectual um when you're living in in beijing they kind of snapped into action and suddenly became these organizations that lock down neighborhoods. I couldn't go home without having my temperature taken and showing a little card that proved that I was a resident of the street that I lived on. And so, you know, Beijing's lockdown was right down to that kind of street and neighborhood level. And it was very, very um, stringently enforced. And, you know, I, I think it kind of, there are all kinds of inherent weaknesses to the way that China's government works, but, but lockdowns kind of plays to its to, to their inherent strengths. And so that's an important part of the picture too. I just mentioned uh, Vincent Nee just had a good piece on neighborhood committees uh, in The mm. Guardian. He's um, started covering them for that. And um, I was I was going to, something I meant to ask you, um, I like it when, if academics are on a session like this to talk about the journalists they're reading, but I'm wondering what, scholarly works, if any, you found particularly useful when you were working on um, on your book? Were there political scientists uh, writing about China in particular who you found valuable? I thought of um, uh, Tony Sage at Harvard just has a book from rebels to rulers about the Communist Party over 100 years, but that was this year. But I'm wondering what you found useful to read to orient yourself to the period. Yeah, um, so there, there were a whole I mean, you, you see in the footnotes lots of the, the books that I drew on, but 
there were a few that really um, helped to shape my thinking, I guess. Um, one framework that I found just useful throughout the whole time was um, Susan Shirk's book, Fragile Superpower, which was, is written, I think, in 2007 or 8, but it just does such a wonderful job of setting out this strange contradiction between this extraordinarily powerful uh, government, but also the insecurities that go along with that. Insecurities about China's domestic growth, um, about its system of governance, about the, the way that the Chinese government fears its own people in some cases. And I think that was a useful way of thinking of China in, in 2008. It's useful now, and it was also use, it's also useful for kind of a lot of the PRC's history. And there were, there were other books like, um, Liu, uh, uh, I think a very, very underused book um, called Chinese Ambassadors by, by Liu Xiaohong, um, which uses some of the memoirs that I drew on is really excellent. And then more recent works like um, Jessica Chen Weiss's um, Powerful Patriots, which which just does a, a beautiful job of thinking about the way that the Chinese government interacts with popular nationalists in the way that the protests are both a tool of the Chinese government and then something that they fear a great deal. Um, I could I could go on and on, um, but, but those are some of the ones that kind of first come to mind. Great. Are there more audience questions, Jessica? Yeah, we've got quite a few coming in now. Um, you mentioned about the change of style by Chinese diplomats around 2017 with a speculated cause of the movie released that year. However, in 2017, the US became more pervasive with false statements and f fake news, not primarily limited, uh, limiting to US domestic politics. Was that a potential cause for the Chinese diplomats to adjust and change their styles to accommodate the changes in the US or world foreign affairs? Yeah, it's a it's a really good question. So so I actually think of the the change in Chinese diplomacy starting a little bit earlier than that, um, and kind of coming in phases. So so I think that um, people who who um, don't specialize in China sometimes miss just how crucial the global financial crisis was in 2008 and 9 to to shifting the way that China thought about its role in the world. And so, you know, if you think of it from from the perspective of a leader in Beijing, they had just hosted the Olympic Games, um, which they pulled off pretty, pretty flawlessly from their, their perspective. Um, and then the, the Western world was kind of plunged into this economic crisis in which um, the governments of the, the US and especially Europe just seemed to be so sluggish in their response. But Beijing launched this, this stimulus package, um, which, you know, turn the Chinese economy around. And uh, m at the time, many people kind of praised perhaps even for saving the global economy. And, and Chinese leaders started to think, you know what, like we, we have been in this kind of mode for a long time of wanting to learn from the West and being quite deferential to the West, that maybe there's something about our system that works and maybe we don't need to be so deferential anymore. And so you started to see in large part in response to that, a much more assertive turn in Chinese foreign policy with respect to territorial disputes, but also re with respect to the way that Chinese diplomats interacted with the outside world. So in 2010, China's then foreign minister, Yang Jiechi, delivered this quite famous set of remarks um, at, a, at a conference in Singapore where he, he said to, uh, and sorry, a conference in Vietnam where he said to Singapore's representative, you know, you are a small country and we are a large country um, and that's just the way it is. And so that, there was this kind of turn then. And I think that that, that was really exacerbated and, 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 and um, became much more pointed after Xi Jinping became Communist Party boss in 2012. Um, so th this has been building for a long, long time. But what happened around that 2017 point was that, um, again, you had um, this sense of great confidence in, in China, kind of fed by the rise of populism in the West and especially by President Trump, that, that maybe there was something deeply wrong with Western societies and maybe there were strengths in China, which meant that they could now afford to take a more assertive approach and that they wouldn't suffer as a result of doing that. And of course, that was exacerbated even further during the coronavirus pandemic. So I, I would kind of break it up into that um, 
in, in that way is, is something that started in 2008 and has, has kind of been amplified ever since then. But to address the, the question of whether US tactics um, contributed, I think the answer is absolutely yes. Um, not in all cases, you know, there have been um, Chinese outbursts in countries like Fiji and Papua New Guinea, where it's pretty hard to figure out exactly how US diplomacy would have would have played a role um, in prompting that behavior on the part of Chinese diplomats. But, for, but in terms of some wolf warrior tactics, you think of the way that the Chinese foreign ministry talked about um, former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo. Um, I, I sat in some of these briefings in Beijing and, and the, the language that was used about Secretary Pompeo was was extraordinary, you know, really, really uh, very angry personal attacks from the foreign ministry. And I think that the reason that the foreign ministry acted in that way was because in his speeches back home, Secretary Pompeo was talking about how Communist Party rule in China was illegitimate and that the US government should work to undermine um, Communist Party influence. And I think that the only way in Xi Jinping's China for the foreign ministry to respond to that was to kind of come out swinging and so so certainly um you know tr trump administration tactics in particular i think exacerbated that that longer term shift towards assertiveness thank you can you comment on some of the ways chinese diplomats have used negative u.s media stories against u.s leaders in recent meetings for example when meeting with john Kerry or anthony blinken yeah, so so this is this is kind of a really long-standing tactic on the part of of Chinese officials, but actually, which which has roots in the Soviet Union and 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 other sort of similar political systems, which you know is often is often described as whataboutism. If if the China's leaders feel like like they're under attack, rather than address those criticisms head on, they'll look for um, flaws in governance in the US or elsewhere where they can say, well, you know, what about your problems? So for the Soviet Union, a favorite tactic was when, when they were criticized for their human rights abuses, they would say, well, look at the problem of racial inequality in the United States. Um, perhaps you shouldn't be pointing the finger at us. And that was a nice way for them to deflect criticism away from them. And I think Chinese leaders kind of treat uh, shortcomings and problems in democratic systems in, in in much the same way now, and so when when you see that happening, the you know a, a good first point is to kind of think, okay, well, so, well, what is the story that they're declining to talk about here? Because um, there's there, there's probably something that would make them quite uncomfortable if they had to look at it head on. Yeah. Other than the U.S., what other countries would be willing to intervene militarily to break a potential PRC blockade on Taiwan? Uh, I mean, I, I think the short answer to that question is that no one knows. Um, the US itself has this policy which is described as strategic ambiguity. Um, so from the 1970s onwards, it's declined to say whether um, it, it would in fact intervene um, militarily to help Taiwan. President Biden had some remarks recently which seemed to change that, but then the White House very quickly walked them back and it it turns out that US policy hadn't shifted after all. Um, so, so it's unclear whether the US would intervene. Um, I think the assumption is off, is usually that it would, but that's not official policy. Uh, and, and whether or not countries like Japan or India or other regional partners or you know, Europe, European NATO allies would get involved, that's even more um, up in the air. But that's that's kind of partly by, um, you know, a function of design um, that, that, that the US and its allies want to have enough ambiguity there to deter the PRC from invading Taiwan, but also not to have themselves entangled in a conflict that um, they don't necessarily want to get involved in. Thank you. This question is from Rafiq Dasani, who you might know of RAND. Are there any risks you see from the more assertive style of Chinese diplomats? Any objectives that were not achieved as a result that a softer approach might have succeeded with? Um, so I, I think on the whole, this new assertive kind of brand of diplomacy has been quite ineffective in terms of realizing China's foreign policy ambitions. In foreign policy, uh, China's foreign policy is still aimed at 
winning friends and and building influence and wolf warrior diplomacy kind of flies in the face of that goal and i think has has kind of crystallized for a lot of people this idea that the prc is a threat or is a problem that needs to be dealt with in the international system and i i think that the you know chinese diplomats persist in acting in this way primarily because of the way that china's political system has developed and because under xi jinping they believe that they'll be safest and they're most likely to get promoted if they act in this very combative assertive way i don't think that many of them really believe deep down that it's it's effective in in winning hearts and minds um and so so i think had there not been an assertive tone uh there would have been uh probably a less intense backlash to, to China. I don't think that Wolf Warrior diplomats caused the backlash, right? Like the the, the depth of, of, of animosity toward China that has built in the US and elsewhere is based on frustrations with Chinese industrial policies, Chinese human rights abuses in Hong Kong and Xinjiang, Xi Jinping's consolidation of power at home and all of these things. But for a long, long time, there was this kind of mismatch between some of those actions that were upset in the outside world and the relatively soft and even ameliorative tone that, that Chinese diplomats took in public. And it was kind of hard to, to square those actions with, with those kind of softer words. And what's happened now is that Chinese diplomats have kind of fallen into line with this, the, the harsh abrasive actions and have, as I said, crystallized this idea that the PRC is a threat. Um, so I, I, you know, I think that um, it probably would have been a lot more productive had China never engaged in that in that kind of diplomacy. Yeah. What does the Chinese government think about accusations that they are trying to nefariously undermine historic U.S. culture? Um, I guess I would need a little bit more context on on the question um, to answer that one. Um, yeah, I'd love love to come back to that, but um, I'd uh, you know it'd be, it'd be great to get a little bit more info. Okay, so uh, Ed, I think that you're in there. If you want to kind of clarify and expand on that, I think there might also be some thoughts that um, people are using social media and Facebook that there might be Chinese bot accounts that are trying to push some of these movements that are tearing down U.S. statues or or things like that that are trying to um, sort of become social media trends and using this kind of astroturfing of, of fake accounts on social media to boost trends that are that are negative towards US history. I think that might be what it's in reference to. Got it. Um, you know, in, in, in terms of in terms of that, I think that um, you know the P the PRC, PRC is kind of starting to experiment with the tactics that allow it to exploit um, divisions in in Western societies. And in, in, in that respect, it's very much kind of a student of Russian behavior. You know, Russia has been very active and very explicit in using social media to try to sow discord in that way. And China has been for a long time much, much more cautious. But if you look at some of the, the statements that US intelligence agencies have put out recently, it, it's kind of become clear that China has started to get a little bit more active um, on that front. And I guess it's not something I've looked into in, in great detail, but social divisions over historical issues might well be an area that um, the foreign actors sought to exploit. But, you know, it's something I'd like to learn more about as well. Great. Um, how are the Trump and now Biden tariffs being viewed by China since China does not pay the tariffs, but some buyers have resourced outside of China while others still buy at the same or greater rate, considering the trade balance increase in favor of China? Yeah, um, I think that, that Chinese leaders on the whole saw the tariffs as part of a much broader effort um, on the part of the US to kind of halt China's rise and to use all the, the, the means at the disposal of the US to, to prevent China taking on a more prominent role in the world. Isn't, that's not surprising because Donald Trump explicitly said while he was president that he hoped that um, China would make no more progress toward catching up with the US economically. So um, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, and I think that Chinese analysts for the most part bought into that um, analysis of what he was doing and um, kind of view the tariffs as part of a much broader um, effort to 
yeah, to halt, halt China's uh, march toward prosperity and, and power. Um, I think now there's also an extent to which they, they think of the, the tariffs as, you know, one bargaining chip um, among many that, that the US has on the table when it comes to normalizing ties. And, you know, China has said that the US should, uh, should remove tariffs immediately. And some people in the Biden administration kind of think that that's something that maybe they want to hang around for a little bit longer. I thought it was very interesting today. I saw it was reported that, that Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen had said that the removal of tariffs might be something that helped um, to ease inflation concerns in the US. And so maybe we'll see this kind of return to the front burner as an issue in US-China relations. It's, it's kind of taken more of a back seat since the Trump administration left office. Thank you. Um, trade diplomacy has been a way that the US and China have found a way to get along. What concerns should we have with regard to the global supply chain issues creating increased strain on US-China relations? Sorry, can you repeat the question one more time? Absolutely. Uh, trade diplomacy has been a way that the US and China have found a way to get along. What concerns hmm. should we have with regard to the global supply chain issues creating increased strain on US-China relations? I, I guess I have to, to slightly take issue with the, the, the premise of the question. Um, I think that there are a lot of um, people in Washington who believe that it is in the interests of the US and China to use trade and economic cooperation as a way to build closer ties, um, especially people who are prominent in the business community who would, who would kind of like to see the relationship stabilized. But I, I guess that... Um, you know, in, in, in a broader sense, the, the process of China has kind of become this bogeyman in the process of globalization, right, and has become, is, is blamed for economic dislocation, which is, which is caused in part by China, but is also caused by mechanization and the growth of robots and, and all of these things as well. And so, so I, I think really, I, I think of trade as something which has really been fueling conflict in, in US-China ties much more than something that's been um, removing it. And the, the, the kind of bright spots such as they are tend to be a little bit more focused on climate issues and, and potentially one day maybe cooperation on global health and, and pandemic relief. Although, of course, in, in recent years, that's been strained um, too. But um, yeah, trade, I, I, I don't see it as front and center of cooperation at the moment. Perfect. Uh, and just one final question. I'll turn it back over to Jeff. What do you think will happen if Evergrande collapses? Does China have the capacity to bail them out, as has been done in the United States for similar companies? Um, so I'm not an expert on the Chinese economy, and so I'm a little bit uh, hesitant to, to go in with a full answer. My, my non-expert sense would be that, yes, China does have the capacity to bail it out, and uh, but that it's, it's very reluctant to do so because it feels like um, too much of China's economic growth has been reliant on the property sector and that um, business leaders in that sector have taken too many risks with the future of the Chinese economy. So what it, what it wants to do, I think, is to teach individual business leaders in Evergrande and elsewhere a, a lesson on what's to come um, and, and the way that they need to behave in order to make China's economic trajectory sustainable, but also to limit broader fallout in the Chinese economy. So if Evergrande does fail, I think it's a pretty safe bet that China will kind of put guardrails around the company and will make sure that that doesn't result in a kind of Lehman Brothers moment, which, which sends shockwaves through the global economy. That's, that's not an easy thing to do, but I think that's what they'll try to do. Great. Uh, well, Peter, thank you so much uh, for our audience. I'm going to put a link to Peter's book in the chat. And uh, again, we appreciate you taking your time today. And Jeff, I'm going to turn this back over to you. Thank you. Oh, this has been this has been a wonderful experience for me. I've learned a lot, and I hope the audience has as well. So, um, thank you for doing this, Peter. Are you, as a final kind of going out thing, has this made you think that someday you'll want to write another book? Um, yeah, this, this turned I, out so well. And yeah, have you got any <laughs> thoughts on what that might be? I I have. Uh, so I'm very confident I want to write another book, and I'm kind of like trying my best to think of um, of topics at the moment, but my head is so much in um, book promotion mode that it's it's kind of difficult to, to flesh out what that might be. Um, 
what I really enjoyed about this book was that it was so that because of the historical focus, it was so different to my day job that it was really um, nice to be able to have a, a kind of intellectual pursuit that was very, very separate from what I was doing every day at work. And so I think um, whatever project comes next, I'll, I'll want to make sure that it also has that sense of like escapism and um, self-indulgence that, that this one had. Um, I'm all for that. As somebody who <laughs> was trained as a historian and ended up sometimes writing about the present, I know what you mean about the, <laughs> right. the cross-training that goes to that. Uh, so thanks very much, and thanks, everybody, uh, for joining us. And back to uh, Kim to take us out of here. You were both excellent. This was such a fascinating and, as Jeffrey said, informative discussion. So we'll have to have you back, Peter. This is such a deep topic. We just barely scratched the surface, I think. Thanks so much. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Thank you both for your time and expertise. For our viewers, uh, we have some terrific upcoming programs tomorrow, Politics in the Time of Coronavirus. And next week, in addition to Politics in the Time of Coronavirus, on November 10th, we have Ambassador Nina Hachigian, who's the Deputy Mayor of Los Angeles for International Relations. And on the 12th, Assignment Russia, a foreign correspondent's insight into the Cold War with award-winning journalist Marvin Kalb. So please go to our website. It's just our initials, L-A-W-A-C-T-H dot org. Register today. You can see our past programs for free. You can become a member, make a donation. Every little bit helps. Please stay safe, stay informed, and we look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Take care. <laughs>